voice of the Hawkeyes, Ed Podolak. And as I said, yesterday was his birthday, and we thought you were about 80, but we're not sure. Well, I'm as old as Mick Jagger. Yeah, Mick Jagger. That's, and the other guy, Gary Dolphin, has been the Hawkeye play-by-play -play man for what's it been now, 22, 3, 4 years? We just got done with 25 last year. 25 years, see? And he's uh, still a little bit under 80 also. Anyway, they're going to give their views on Iowa football. They're experts, so uh, Gary... Ed, take it on. Phil, uh, did you just turn 90? Did I, did I read? You just turned 90? 92. 92, okay. You know, uh, Phil's the only guy that retired 20 years before he announced it. <laughs> uh, so uh, we better our eye on him for a while. It's good to see him, though. I, I, looks like Florida Florida has been good to you. <clears throat> Naples, he always likes to... He had a hole in one here about a month ago, sent me 28 pictures of it, standing there holding the, the golf ball. We're all up here working like dogs, uh, and he's enjoying the good life. Well, but but he's earned it. It was either his fifth or sixth hole in one, and I played a lot of golf, which means he never had a real job. <laughs> if he could have five holes in one. He was a sports information director. I mean, that's all, that's all fun and games, isn't it? Especially if you're at Iowa, but uh, hey, good afternoon. Uh, great to, to see uh, not only in this particular room, but throughout the building. Uh, it's really alive, and uh, you can always tell when the football season's close by because Fry Fest, Hall of Fame uh, induction ceremony tonight, uh, half a dozen of, uh, of uh, young men and women that we enjoyed watching compete for uh, a number of years, a few years back. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Football tomorrow, sold out regular season, or sold out seven game schedule, and against a quality opponent uh, tomorrow. These guys are really good, uh, but I can promise you the Hawks aren't overlooking them. They'll be ready for uh, the Jackrabbits. And uh, this might be our first team we've ever played that has the nickname Jackrabbits. I, don't, I can't remember another one. Well, and you know what, how about uh, North Dakota? Dakota is well. They're the Bison, I believe. North Bison? Dakota State, yeah. And North then Dakota there's State. Somebody over there that are, that is the Panthers. So those Jackrabbits have to stay in front of all that other stuff. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Jackrabbits, yeah. They can run, they can hop, and they can run. And they've, uh, you know, they're built a lot like Iowa. Uh, uh, John Stiegelmeyer, who's been there, what, 26, seven years at South Dakota State. They've been in the FCS, the Football Championship Series. Uh, you and I is at that level. Uh, they uh, and, and, you know, really, what's the difference between FCS and FBS? About 20 scholarships. I think they, last I heard, they could offer 65 scholarships, FCS, you and I, schools like Northern Iowa, and uh, Iowa can offer 85 scholarships in, one, in a uh, four-year class. Now, with the transfer portal and all, the, all these other things that he and I don't follow, uh, entering the picture, uh, it, that those numbers could have changed. So really, they have 65 uh, worthy Division One football players, and I'm hoping that Iowa depth uh, will wear them down over four quarters. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know. We'll get his thoughts in a minute, but you know, typically to me, the first game of the year, uh, you're playing a lot of young guys that some are out of high school and they haven't played at this level. 70,000 screaming Hawkeye fans will be there tomorrow. Uh, so they're a little nervous. Once the game kicks off, I think they'll be fine. But where I'm going with this is typically special teams and turnovers on opening weekend. Uh, if two teams are pretty even, uh, special teams and turnovers will... Uh, if you look at the Iowa-Iowa State Series the last few years, it's come down to turnovers and great plays uh, by our special teams. Iowa had 140 yards of offense last year in Ames and won by 10 points. Uh, it was because of special teams and, and, and turnovers. And so uh, it's gone Iowa's way. Hopefully it will again tomorrow. Uh, I mean, you've played in a number of opening day games. Uh, what say you about the first one out of the barrel? Well, the best thing is you don't have to practice against your teammates anymore because until this week, the team's divided in half. Defense, offense. You compete every day in practice and your teammates are cheering for an offensive gain and defense is cheering for an interception or turnover. 
Now you get to go into the locker room and you're on the same team. <laughs> and uh, it makes a big difference. And you know, when you practice every day and um, <clears throat> you're used to idiosyncrasies of uh, the offense or the defense, the defense is always ahead of the offense this time of year. And uh, that's because basically they react to what's happening where the offense is trying to create something to happen. So I'm really excited about this. Uh, you've been to practice. I've been to practice. A lot of names on this chart that we have not been able to see play in front of 70,000 people. And we've got some really good players that are going to get exposed this weekend. I can tell you this, uh, Gavin and LaShawn Williams, who averaged six yards of carry in the Citrus Bowl, I mean, they, that's where I saw this young offensive line. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Gavin and LaShawn are going to be, uh, well, they're already thanking God that they don't have to run anywhere near Jack Campbell uh, other than limited practice contact Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays starting next week. Uh, I, I won't say who ended up on his backside. It was about two weeks ago. I'm talking to Lon Olenzak, who played at Iowa, and we're standing on the sidelines watching. Pre and it was a full contact scrimmage. Officials were there throwing flags. And I heard this pop from 30 yards away. And I look up in time to see this running back going straight backwards about five yards, landing on his shoulder pads. And number 31 is just kind of standing there. It's like a guy ran into a, a, a hundred-year-old oak tree, and 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 Jack will extend his arms a little bit when he hits you. Uh, this guy is phenomenal. He he is the real deal. He's a bigger version of Pat Anger, uh, if you can visualize that. He's six foot five, two hundred and forty-six pounds, and he can run sideline to sideline. And he's so smart. So when, when you see number 31 tomorrow, uh, he'll, he'll jump out at you. He'll, he'll catch your attention. We watched him last year. He was unbelievable. He, he was always where the loose ball was. Uh, I think he had a scoop and a score. It might have been against Iowa State, as I remember. Uh, but he had a couple turnovers for touchdowns. Uh, he's just a, a great kid. Doesn't say he, – he, you're lucky to get him to string two sentences together. He just goes about his business. Great family up there in Cedar Falls. And so Jack Campbell, everything's built around Jack Campbell. And uh, he, he's, a, as, he, as he likes to say, that guy's a football player. Well, and uh, Coach said when he recruited him, he went up to look at him, he thought he was a better basketball player than football player. So when you're 6'5 and 240 and you play middle linebacker and you can stuff a basketball behind your head, you're something special. Oh, well, we watched him play in the state tournament, you know, and he was about 40 pounds lighter than he is now. And there's not a lot of baby fat on Jack Campbell. So you put him and Seth Benson, who's from Sioux Falls, he'll, he'll be extra motivated tomorrow, and a senior. And then uh, those two kids, uh, uh, J, J, uh, Justin Jacobs and Jay uh, Higgins, they'll alternate. One will be a cash back and a lighter linebacker. Uh, Iowa's well set at the linebacking positions. Uh, up front, they're going to play seven or eight guys, names that you've heard, but names that really aren't established yet. Uh, John Wagner's been around a couple of years. He's a senior. He'll be the leader of that group. Everybody else is uh, way underclassmen. Uh, Lucas Van Ness, uh, Noah Shannon has been around a couple of years. Uh, Ethan Herkett is back healthy. Lucas Van Ness, there's a name I'll give you. Watch for him tomorrow. He's been He's been unbelievable uh, through spring ball and, and uh, fall camp. A lot of these guys didn't practice at all in the spring because they either had corrective surgeries done or they were nicked up or bruised. Or, in the case of Jack Campbell, uh, you know what Jack Campbell can do. You don't want him running around too much taking contact practice because he hits too hard and he might hurt himself uh, at some point. But uh, uh, in the back end, they've got to replace uh, Jack Kerner, uh, Dane Belton, Matt Hankins, they lost three quality starters, but uh, Quinn Schulte really emerged last year. Kayvon Merriweather is back. Um, uh, Jamari Harris will be back. Terry Roberts will start tomorrow. And of course, save the best for last. He with 11 career interceptions, uh, Riley Moss. You know, it's, it's amazing what these pro scouts look for. He went, to the, uh, he went to the combine in Indianapolis this spring 
and they told him to come back to school. And I said to Riley, I said, why'd you come back? I thought you were going to go to the NFL. Well, he said, they told me once again, my arms are too short and I can't run fast enough. So I'll use that as extra motivation this year, and then I'll go to the NFL next year. <laughs> so I mean, he's, that's his attitude. And uh, I said, you're not fast enough. The kid won four state sprint championships at Ankeny. Now, I know you don't run in a straight line in football, but uh, who knows what they're looking for. Anyway, that's the defense. Offensively, uh, the offensive line looks like they'll be okay tomorrow. I say that because they've, they've had a lot of nagging injuries. Uh, so you'll probably see guys in positions that you're not used to seeing, but that's Iowa's offensive line mentality. They always recruit guys. They're always six foot five to six foot seven that they know they can get to 300 pounds eventually. And, uh, but they, they train them to be guards and tackles, or guards and centers. And, and it's going to pay off this year because, number one, they're still very young. There's one senior in the top, I think, nine uh, the guys that rotate in the two deep, or eight or nine. One senior, a whole lot of sophomores and redshirt freshmen. Now, they've been around, that means they've been around for a couple of years. Uh, and they got better as the season went on last year. You know, when Kyler shot, jumped off that hay bale and broke a bone in his foot two weeks before the season started, I thought, boy, that, that's not a good sign. And he ended up missing a month and a half. And then Cody Ince uh, had nagging thumb injuries, and he decided to uh, just quit football, just go back, get his degree. So there's two starters out of the offensive line a year ago. People forget that. Uh, now, we didn't know Tyler Lindebaum was going to be as good as he was. We knew he'd be good, but thank goodness he had the kind of year he had. Uh, Connor Colby was a freshman. Uh, Jack Plum was a, a junior who had not really played. Uh, Nick DeYoung, Mason Richmond had nagging injuries. And then you saw in the Citrus Bowl, I mean, we talked about this. I really like the way our running game uh, developed in, uh, in that Citrus Bowl, and it's carried on right through now. That offensive line's pretty healthy. And the kid I haven't mentioned is Logan Jones. Uh, he came over from the defensive front. Uh, he's going to be the new center, and he, he is, he's really going to be good. He's got Linda Baum's mentality. In other words, he'd, he'd uh, have your eye for a grape. He'd chew your knuckles off if you get too close to his, his jaw. He's got that, uh, I'm trying to think of who in the Conrad Dover. Killer attitude. He's got my attitude. Killer attitude. And yeah. thankfully, he doesn't have my size. Um, but Conrad Dobler, for you old timers, can remember when he played. He's got a little Conrad Dobler in him. Now, yeah, I played against him. Remember, I he was in St. Louis. I was in Kansas City. He should have been arrested after every game for what he did. But anyway, the the other uh, uh, young lineman that I want to see is Michael Mislinski. He's been hurt. And he came in here really highly touted out of Jacksonville, Florida. Mike and I Mislinski. understand he's healthy now. Mike Mislinski is a kid from Jacksonville, I think Jacksonville, Florida. Committed to Texas. He was going to Texas, so you know he's a pretty good football player. But it came down to Texas and Iowa. Uh, that coaching staff got let go two years ago, and that, that was our break. So he went back home, talks to his folks, really a bright kid academically, which all the Hawkeyes are and decided to come to Iowa. And he can play center or guard. He'll, he'll, he'll back up both positions. Uh, and now I'm not sure if he's 100% yet. You will see Bo Stevens tomorrow. Bo Stevens, is, uh, is he a redshirt? Uh, yeah, he's a here he is. Um, redshirt freshman redshirt out of freshman. Blue Springs, Missouri. Yeah, down near Kansas City, right, yeah. Blue Springs? Who came from Blue Springs, Missouri? Remember? What great running back who's on the staff now at Iowa, came from Blue Springs, Missouri. Wasn't that Liddell Betts? Yes. Yes, Liddell, Liddell Betts. Betts. Uh, I'm he guessing. had no offensive line either, and he still gained 1,000 yards. Liddell Betts, yeah. Still yeah. played seven years in the NFL, whatever. But Bo Stevens, a redshirt freshman, he's a little bitty guy. He's 6'6", 308. And uh, I think he came in as a tackle, and now they got him at guard. And so uh, he, he's definitely going to play tomorrow. You know, Kirk, Kirk believes, in, uh, and George Barnett, brilliant young offensive line coach, they believe if these guys are healthy, they're going to throw them out there. They don't care what, what year they're, uh, they're serving in. So it's, uh, the depth is much better this year. Uh, but keep in mind, Iowa will have the second youngest roster in the Big Ten this year. 
So big, big fourteen. A lot of good players. They're just uh, they're just very young and raw. But th- th- there's a good side to that because they don't know any better. They're going to go out and hit people. You'll you'll probably see a flag or two tomorrow, which is typical in the first game. But I, I really like the makeup of that offensive line. Oh yeah, I mean, and the main thing that you talked about is that coach makes them be able to play every position. You know, move them around. If you get injuries, move over there. And, you know, you've got Jack Plum, who's been a starter for a number of years. Big guy. He's uh, 6'7", 297. In fact, when he checked in, the equipment man said uh, when he was a freshman, this is not the basketball equipment. This is the football equipment. Because he was six seven, about two hundred, and now he's six seven, two ninety seven. You know, that's a common component with Iowa because uh, they have to recruit that way. Is uh, they look for multiple sports stars, multiple positions. St- Chad Greenway, I remember he played eight man football in South Dakota, and he came in. He he, he was a great safety in uh, in high school, and he played quarterback. And he played a number of positions. They like to find guys that, uh, now hopefully they're also valedictorians, because uh, that means they're really smart too. And we've had a lot of smart players who are great athletes. But uh, they, they look for multiple position players. And in addition to that, Kirk always looks for guys that are team captains, because usually they've been elected captain by their teammates. And he likes that kind of uh, personality because they know they're respected. And we've had a lot of those types of kids uh, come to Iowa. Uh, the running backs, I love our running backs. Gavin Williams, LaShawn Williams, no relation. One's from Chicago, one's from Altoona. And uh, they, they run hard. They're both six feet, 210 pounds. LaShawn's not quite six feet. But, but they're bigger than our backs that we're used to uh, at Iowa. Now, Sean Green was 230. He, he was a hybrid. But Freddie Russell was, what, 5'7", 185. So they, they grow them on all sizes. But I, uh, what I like about Gavin Williams is he can flat out, spe- he, he's a speed demon as well. He can run, and he's 210 pounds. Boy, you love to have, a, in, in Iowa's system, you love those guys that can run north and south and have speed, and they're big. Well, he's a slasher. Mm-hmm. And that's the, uh, in our offense, those are the most successful running backs. He got a slash in there, like we used to say, run in there where it's dark uh, because <laughs> you're surrounded by 300 pound killers, but get your nose in there and make some yards. Now, I've got a question for you, and it's, yeah. I'm going to go to the wide receiver end of this. What's the latest on Keegan Johnson? Is he healthy? He, he's not 100%, uh, and this is just me guessing, watching. Uh, he, he's, he's missed a lot of time. Uh, he might play tomorrow, uh, but uh, I, I would say don't expect to see him out there. I mean, they, wanna, they want him. Keegan Johnson's the type of kid you want totally healthy. You don't want him playing with any kind of a lingering injury. Uh, you'll see a kid out there tomorrow named Alec Wick, who's from Iowa City, Regina. A walk-on, and you know if he played for Iowa City, Regina, he's a good football player. He's just a bit little bitty guy. I don't have the two deep, sir. Uh, well, he's a uh, six-one, one ninety-six. All right, that's bigger than I thought. He doesn't look six-one, one ninety-six. Well, that's because he was standing next to Campbell. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> but he's had a wonderful camp. So you'll see Alec uh, out there tomorrow. How much? Well, Brody Brecht. Now That's is healthy want, enough that to was play. My next question yep. for Brody Breck, who he who can throw it 95 miles an hour over there for Coach Rick. Uh, uh, he, he'll he'll be out there. Uh, they're they're going to play a lot of those guys. Arlen Bruce has had a he had a great spring, and uh, he's had a terrific fall camp. So Arlen Bruce will be, I would say, the focal point among the wide receiver group. Let me just take a peek there. Oh, Jack Johnson is another uh, walk-on. He's from uh, West Des Moines Valley. Uh, you might see him out there. So that's one, two, three. That's five guys. Uh, Jacob Bostic's hurt. I don't think he, he'll play tomorrow. But here, here's the good news. And I would guess the wide receiver group is probably the, the, the group that's nicked the most. 
uh, and hopefully they're all back healthy next week. But th this tight end group, mm, I really like what I'm seeing there. This might be the deepest group of tight ends that I can remember in terms of guys that can play. Uh, you know what Sam Laporta brings to the table. He's all Big Ten. Luke Lachey, we've been waiting for Luke, legacy player. His daddy's got, I think, three Super Bowl rings. He was a member of the famed Hogs with the Washington, hmm. Uh, and he has my job for Ohio State. Yeah. He's the color guy at Ohio State, and his son came to Iowa. He's That's the analyst for the Buckeyes. Well, Ohio State doesn't use tight ends the way we do. <laughs> now, Luke was a great basketball player, and uh, I think he was a, a wide receiver, and they played, he, played, he played in the secondary, six foot five. That tells you how good of a high school player. And right there in Columbus, and I heard from Jim Lachey. Jim Lachey, his dad, was an all-pro for Joe Gibbs. I was talking to Jim the other day. I was on their uh, radio show. We were previewing the Big Ten. He said, hey, Dolph, I've had a chance to listen to you and Eddie driving home uh, last year from Kinnick. So he and his wife have been out to Kinnick a number of times. They love the atmosphere at Kinnick Stadium. He said, you guys are pretty good. I go, well, thanks, Jim. Well, Appreciate we've it. lasted 26 years somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Luke Lachey, when you're a legacy player, uh, the light switch has gone on for him. So those will be the top two guys. But let me tell you about two other guys. This kid, uh, Addison Astringa, uh, I think he's a walk-on. I don't think they've offered him. Kid from Wisconsin was a late offer. Big string bean of a tight end. And he thinks he's a fast slot receiver. And he runs down the field. He actually has the gall to run near Jack Campbell. And, you know, Jack's kind of laid off him because he knows he's a first-year player and probably doesn't get it yet. But this kid, uh, I bring that up jokingly, but Ferentz loves his demeanor. He's fearless. He gets knocked sideways. He jumps up and runs back to the huddle. And, uh, and that'll, that'll, uh, that'll work out itself uh, after a couple of years. But look for him tomorrow. And he catches the ball. And he runs these routes over the middle. He doesn't care if he's double covered. He's got long arms. He was a great high school athlete up at, I believe it was Wanakee. And then the other kid is the transfer from Lafayette, Steven Stilianos. I love that name, Stilianos. Now, where does he come from? Lafayette. Now, where is that? Well, you're asking too many questions about Lafayette. <laughs> I, I believe it's, uh, it's Pennsylvania or New York. Okay. Uh, but he's a... I think he's a fourth-year guy, so he'd have two years of eligibility left, and that's rarity. We don't take many transfers, but Kirk loved this kid when he came in on his recruiting visit, offered him, and, and he had some good offers, from, especially from out east, uh, but he loves the way Iowa uses the tight ends, and they didn't throw to him much out at Lafayette. Well, he'll, he'll get it thrown to him uh, tomorrow going forward. So th those four guys can play. There's another guy that I won't mention him because he's a little nicked up right now, but, but he's, he's, he's talented. I mean, we always have good tight ends at tight end you. Uh, Dallas Clark going into the Hall of Fame tonight. Uh, he's, he's the exception. But the tight ends, you'll see Laporta split out. He'll, he'll play, he played some of that last year, the slot receiver. So with the, with the injuries at wideout, you'll see Sam out there tomorrow. And we all know if the ball's anywhere near in his area code, he's going to catch it. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not as concerned about the, the wide receivers as maybe some people are, but then again, I'm not okay. in the locker room every day. Here's the big question. Quarterback and our passing game. What have you observed? We've got some new coaching help in there, and yeah. I've only been able to see one practice because I was in Colorado and I had a hip replacement, and so I was resting up on the Roaring Fork River uh, but I know you were down there, so tell me what well, you've seen. Uh, again, this is me talking, uh, and I visited with the coaches uh, about it. But, you know, it, it's, it's not – I mean, it's black and white, as simple as uh, Spencer's a fifth-year guy. He's a senior. Uh, he, he's ahead of Alex in terms of uh, snaps and what he, uh, defenses that he's seen. Uh, he's a little, a little older than Alex Padilla. And uh, I, I just had my sit down with Kirk a little bit ago, and he said, there's really uh, no major differences. They both started. They both have won big games for us. He said, I'm comfortable playing either or or both. 
He doesn't want to play both in the same game, but he'll play either or and do it with confidence. But he said Spencer's a little more uh, older, a little more mature maybe. He's seen more than what Alex has. Opening day, he wants his most experienced guy out there. I think it's as simple as that. Uh, and that said, he's going to be on a shorter leash. Um, I don't want to say they've condensed the offense. I don't want to say they simplified uh, the passing attack. I mean, this is Brian's, what, second or third year? Third is first coordinator. Year, the first, first year is quarterback, quarterback coach. coach. And if you remember, Iowa's best years was when, uh, at least in the Ferentz regime, was uh, when Kenny O'Keefe was both offensive quarter, coordinator and quarterback's coach and called the plays. So I, I think that's what Kirk's decided they want to get back to. We want the same guy coaching the quarterbacks, calling the plays. And, you know, unlike a lot of people, I, I, I haven't had any problem with the game plan of Brian Ferentz. I'm, well, I guess it's the execution, then. <laughs> that we it, were 121st and 132. It's, to me, it's, it's you got to make plays. Yeah. If you're out there, you got to throw the ball where the guy can catch it. Or if you're at the other end, not hanging at all on the quarterback, you got to catch the ball. And you got to block. And as Podolak knows, you got to hit that cutback. And so th there were a lot of issues with the offense last year. I think it still comes back to the offensive line. I, we, uh, if I remember correctly, we were sacked 36 times last year. Now, that's not all on the offensive line. They've told Spencer, look, we want, you, if, if at all possible, could you come up second and 10 instead of second and 18? Because when you're second and long, really long, that, that really puts the pressure on the offense. So I think, you know, if, if Spencer, he's going to be, be on a short leash, he's going to have to produce, but he needs everybody around him producing as well. Well, let me, uh, I know Kirk has always been adamant about this, that he doesn't want to play two quarterbacks. But, you know, there were a couple of years there that we did that and we won a lot of games. And that's just part of his philosophy. I know you get to talk to him a lot more than I do about that, but... He just feels he wants one guy to be in charge starting on Monday through the game on Saturday. Kirk Ferentz is okay with uh, moving parts in the offensive line, interchangeable guys that can play. He's not comfortable uh, shifting quarterbacks around. That's the most important position on the field, with all due respect to running backs. But the quarterback, uh, you, you look at all the great winning teams in the NFL, the powerful programs in college football consistently, they have great quarterbacks. And it's not just Tom Brady. It's, it's, it's guys that are the most consistent, that get it done and don't turn the ball over. So Spencer had uh, 10 touchdown passes and 9 interceptions last year. Uh, and he, uh, you know, my old amateur eyes is he, he hangs on, he was holding on to the ball too long. There's not a quarterback alive, and you play quarterback, you know what I'm talking about. There's not a throw they don't think they can make or, or can't make. Uh, there's not a window they don't think they can squeeze it through. And that, that's a special mentality, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yes, I think last year um, he held on to the ball. And I'm just, I'm not being critical. That's my observation. And um, he's got to read through the process. One, two, three. Uh, throw it away. Right. And it just seemed last year that um, he kept trying to force it down the middle a little too much. You know, he has a great tight end, and he wanted to get it to Laporta, but how many balls did we see go down the middle that weren't catchable? He, he threw it into traffic jams, for sure. And uh, but, but I think he's really, you know, watching him in practice, you know, they're getting it more out on the edge. Uh, he's... he's uh, about the same weight, but he's muscled up more, so he's moving better. Uh, and he is, uh, well, he, he did a great job of hitting that cheerleader in the head at the Citrus Bowl. When, when he whistled that one out of bounds, he threw it about 45 yards, hit it right in the back of the head. Thank goodness she didn't turn around. And, uh, and thank goodness it was one of their cheerleaders. It wasn't one of ours. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, I mean, he, he uh, you know, they lost that game on a last possession, not that a bowl game, uh, it doesn't mean anything in the standings. It's a reward for a, 
a, a good season. You know, here we are sitting, uh, sitting here talking about the quarterback <laughs> controversy. And they won 10 games last year yeah. uh, and the West Division Championship. So uh, he, he's a good quarterback that can get better. And if not, then Alex Padilla is certainly capable. Uh, I know there's a lot of Joe, Joe Labus fans out there, as uh, you like to say, the third string quarterback's always the most popular guy on the roster. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he, he's, he's a year away yet. I mean, he's 6'4", 225 pounds. He can really run. And boy, does he have a gun on him. Uh, but uh, his problem is he doesn't think there's a throw he can't make. <laughs> Or he thinks there's a throw he can't that, that he can't make, uh, and uh, he he takes a little bit too much of a chance for Coach Ferentz's eyes. So he'll he'll sit and watch and learn again this year, and uh, uh, be ready to uh, battle Padilla next year for the starting. Well, time. I lost one of my best friends this week, Lenny the Cool yeah. Dawson. Lay, the great Lenny and Dawson. Let me tell you something. If um, they had the same rules about hitting a quarterback that they have today. He could have played till he was 50. But back then, they just creamed him. A Deacon Jones, I mean, knocked him upside down so many times. But I always knew this. When I was running a pass pattern and I turned around and looked for the ball, I could stiff arm with both hands because he would stick it right in my helmet. It would just be coming right in. Right there. Stud. It would stick in my helmet. Now, that was a passer. He Lenny was Dawson, unbelievable. The old Purdue Boilermaker, Lenny Dawson. <clears throat> yeah, he was uh, he was a phenomenal talent. I remember watching those early Super Bowls against Green Bay and against the Vikings when you won the Super Bowl. And uh, well, Dawson was MVP, wasn't he? If I, if I remember yeah. correctly, and he was the MVP of the Super Bowl. Yeah. Went into the Hall of Fame early. Um, Great and talent. He uh, was a tremendous. Player, I remember we uh, traded for a defensive tackle from Oakland Raiders one year, and when he came in and went to training camp and he saw Len Dawson, Len Dawson probably couldn't do 10 push-ups. He had a little skinny body, but he had a hand that flicked that ball out, and he said, gosh, if we'd have known that that was his body out at Oakland, we'd have killed him long before this. <laughs> so that was he... Um, that was, he was, well, he could make plays. He was a football player. Yeah, a football player. Hank Stram, uh, Hank Stram was an old Purdue guy and ultimately had Dawson and you at, uh, at, uh, at Kansas City. But uh, I'm going to give you a couple names uh, that uh, you probably don't know a whole lot about, but let me tell you, unless I miss my bet, uh, these guys are going to be stars. Number one, Cooper DeGene. Uh, kid from Odebolt, Iowa, which is about as far west as you can get without stepping into the Missouri River. Uh, I asked one coach, uh, I, I don't know, Cooper, Cooper might have 10 or 12 interceptions this fall, uh, has had in fall practice. That's, he's all over the field. Uh, he'll line up at safety. Uh, they'll, they'll use him, I'm guessing they'll use him some as a cash back. But this kid played like 10 sports in high school and excelled at them all. Brilliant student. Uh, he, he is a phenomenal talent. Uh, I believe he's, a, what is he, a redshirt sophomore? Yeah, he is a, a now I've got him right here, and he is a sophomore because yep. he played as a freshman. He played at a high school. It, it's got an acronym this long. O-D-G-B-I-H, I think is where. Uh, but So you'll never hear that. It'll be Odebolt. Uh, and he's a bolt, let me tell you. I asked a coach uh, earlier in the camp, I said, I'm watching him run. I said, where, where do you think he's going to end up? What position? He goes, any place he wants to play. <laughs> he'll so, probably be our return guy, too. I, I'm he? guessing he'll be back there tomorrow, you know, with Charlie Jones leaving to go to PU. Um, you'll see Al, uh, probably Alec Wick. Uh, I'm guessing Alec did some punt and kick returning at Regina. Um, uh, I look for Cooper to be back there tomorrow on uh, punts and or kick. Re I say kick returns. They don't return kicks anymore. Hell, they oh. kick it into the uh, stands. The stands. Yeah. Uh, that's something I really miss is kick returns. I mean, those, you know, I grew up when Gail Sayers was returning kicks. Uh, there wasn't a more exciting play to watch in football than 
Gail Sayers dancing from sideline to sideline. So I'm hoping someday they move the, the kickoff line back. Now, I know they're trying to save on injuries, you know, guys flying down the yeah. field. And speaking of kicking, uh, Tory Taylor is, is just unbelievable. And you talk about a big help to the defense, and we've talked about this ad nauseum on the air. It's not so much for his distance. He hits it 46 yards, whatever. It's his hang time and where the ball ends up when it dies. It, I mean, you were one of the great punt returners of all time. Uh, you, were, you, you were explaining the difference between a kick return and a punt return one time. I thought that was the most graphic uh, uh, illustration uh, where, where if you're returning kicks, which you did both, you can see the ball coming and you got those guys in your sight line. When you're trying to field a punt, you're... Talk oh, about that. Yeah. Uh, come down quick, ball. Come down quick. Um, well, you, the punts, and especially with the wind, um, and they can blow them anywhere. But you have to figure out right away where it's coming down. And then you've got to get over to that spot. And then you look at the coverage. And I, Hank Stram used to yell at the sideline, Look at the ball. Look at the ball. Well, the ball wasn't going to kill me, but those guys coming down were. And um, so uh, if you have room to catch it, you catch it and go. Otherwise, you have to. Um, Fair catch. catch. Now, I've got an, an, another name on this chart yeah. that I yeah. need your expertise on. T.J. Hall, Fresno, California freshman. When's the last time we had somebody from Fresno, California? Where where did he come from? I, I don't know if we've ever had. Uh, and, you know, he was uh, not a late commit, but he was mulling over a number of offers. He, at the time, I don't know what he was ranked when he came when he committed to Iowa. He's a high three-star, with almost a four-star, if you believe in the, the star system. As Ference always says, I only care how many stars they have after their name when they leave Iowa, not when they're coming to Iowa. So we'll make him into good football players, and that's what we do. Uh, but yeah, he he TJ, I, you'll definitely see him on special teams. He's a headhunter, he loves contact, and uh, and he'll be out there. But they they like his speed, they like his moxie. You know, he's a smart player, and if he's coming from Fresno, you know he's a tough player. You know, he's a tough kid. Uh, so that's another name: uh, Cooper DeGene, TJ Hall, Aaron Graves, from. Uh, the metropolis of Dayton, Iowa. I think that's Webster County, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Aaron Gray's, uh, you, you, I don't know if you saw Kurt's, uh, Kirk's uh, quote a couple weeks ago when asked about Aaron Graves. Uh, he's a pure freshman. I saw him at an iClub outing in Carroll this summer, and I went up to introduce myself, and he got up out of his chair, and I go, Hello, Mr. Graves. <laughs> I'm Gary Dolphin. He's 6'4". Now, he played his senior year in high school. He's 6'4", about 260 in high school. That's gigantic for a high school player, for a defensive rush man. Uh, so he's probably 270 now. He'll probably be 290 in a couple years. Uh, and he just, he just kind of throws bodies out of the way and gets to the quarterback. And, and Ference was asked about him a couple weeks ago, are you going to play Aaron Graves? He goes... We'd be stupid not to play Aaron Graves. <laughs> and that's, uh, so that tells you that he sees what most of us are seeing in Aaron Graves. So, uh, but, but he's got to bide his time because that front, you'll see eight guys out there tomorrow. Uh, even with Logan Lee moving to, to center, uh, Lucas Van Ness is one of my favorites. John Wagner's been around a couple years. Noah Shannon is a veteran. Uh, but, you know, Noah Shannon hasn't played a ton in his career. He played a lot last year. One of my favorite players, not because he's from Ames, but he gets to the quarterback as Joe Evans. And he is a big play guy. So he and Van Ness led the uh, team with, I think it was uh, six and a half sacks each last year. And they each had eight, nine, ten tackles for loss. I always, I always look at that TFL stat because if you're making tackles for loss, those are big plays and field position. What was it? Was uh, the, the play Evans made? Was it Minnesota? 
We kept pushing. He had two sacks in that one series. That they ran the clock out at the end of the yeah. game, night game. Joe Evans just put that defense on his back. I love that kid, former high school quarterback at Ames High School. I love it when the Ames High School players come to Iowa City. Well, and didn't his um, father then transfer? He was a superintendent of schools in Ames, and he moved I think he over. played at Iowa State, didn't he, his yeah, dad? Yeah, but then he, he moved the family over here when uh, Joe <laughs> signed out. That's a smart guy. Yeah, Get out of Ames and go to Iowa City. Well, well, what about Waiya Black? Waiya Black. Yeah, he. I mean, this kid was heralded coming out of Minnesota a couple of years ago, and he's he's a good player. He's just playing with a bunch of really good down linemen, and and you know what? When we get to late October and November, and you're one of those guys, and you've been playing with your hand in the dirt for two months, not counting the month and a half fall camp, and it's 90 degrees, to have that kind of depth. You, you watch come uh, early November how good this defensive line will be is because they'll be fresh and they'll be creating turnovers and they'll be getting tackles for loss and they'll be getting to the quarterback. Uh, that's always been big with Iowa's defense here the last couple of years when they develop depth like that. All right. Um, I don't think we've left anything out. Let's take a couple questions before we wrap it up. Any questions at all from the group? Good, we've covered it all. Yes, we have you covered know, it nobody all. Nobody <laughs> should have any questions. Uh, uh, let's get you Yes, off. sir. Is Xavier Wampa going to play? Uh, yes, he's going to play probably more on special teams. You know, the, um, the dilemma they have, um, it's not that Xavier can't play corner or safety wherever they're slotting him, but... They've got, you know, Kayvon Merriweather, Quinn Schulte's a junior, Merriweather's a senior, Riley Moss is, you're not going to take Riley out of the lineup. So Xavier gets that, but they, they, they could play him at uh, the cashback, but uh, you're going to see Justin Jacobs, uh, who, who uh, oh, by the way, is a 235-pound linebacker that can play as that extra, that nickelback. That tells you all you need to know about his speed. But... Now, unless their smoke screening is here, I mean, Xavier, you know, he's a, he's a five-star for good reason. He's a great player and a great get. Uh, but you'll see him on special teams. I think they'll break him in there. Remember, he came in in January, and so he's still getting up to speed. He had a great spring. Uh, and, you know, academically, these guys need to be on plane one as well. But, uh, oh, he's definitely going to play. How much? I think it'd be more on special teams for the first Four games, maybe. Anything else? What's that? Did we underutilize Charlie Jones? Um, I'm trying to. Well, who were you going to start him ahead of? Keegan Johnson, Arlen Bruce, um, Nico Regani. Now, Nico hasn't been able to stay healthy, unfortunately. Now, Charlie Jones goes to a school where they don't run the football. All they do is throw it. So, yeah, he's going to, and he had a great night last night. What do you have, a dozen catches? Yeah, 115 yards, something like that. Yeah, so he and that quarterback played together in high school, if I remember correctly, Aiden O'Connell. So it's a way different type of offense. Uh, Charlie, I don't think we underutilized Charlie. I mean, he came here from Buffalo. And uh, we gave him a chance, and he was the best punt returner in, in the Big Ten, maybe in college football. Uh, kick returns, he made plays. But he had a lot of good players in front of him. And Purdue had nobody coming back at wide receiver. They got Tyrone Tracy and Charlie Jones, two former Iowa Hawkeyes as their starters. So, huh? I can't hear him, and it's probably just as well. What? Any, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? Oh, Jennings Dunker. Yeah, we, Jennings, he's in the mix. I mean, he had a really good fall camp. Young man out of Lena Winslow High School, which is up by uh, where I come from, up in Dubuque, right across the river. It's a good league. No, you might see him tomorrow. You might see him tomorrow. You know, if, if it's... Uh, anything as humid as it is today, you'll see all those guys out there. Now, Jennings is, he's planed up. I mean, he, they liked him last year. It's just, 
Iowa doesn't like to play pure freshmen in the, in the, in the offensive line, but no, he, he's on our two deeps. Yeah, Matt Fagan uh, is on there as well, so it's, uh, it's a good problem to have that all these guys are healthy and, and they're young. So Jennings is going to be a player. He, he's going to play a lot. Thanks for asking about him. Maybe we'll take one more. Yes, ma'am. The average weight of the offensive line? I just did that this morning. Uh, um, let me go back, because Logan Lee, Logan Lee's 275, which is good for a defensive lineman, but uh, uh, his, his attitude puts another 20 pounds on him. So he, he, he'll be just fine tomorrow. Um, he's got great feet. I mean, you're, you're going to love Logan, Logan uh, what did I say, Logan Lee? I meant Logan, uh, Logan Jones. Actually, he's 280, so I don't want to shortchange him. Uh, I, I averaged it out today, uh, 301 pounds. 301. That's bigger than what, you know, for years, you go back to Riley Reefer, Brian Bulaga, um, Bruce Nelson, now Gallery and uh, uh, Brandon, uh, Brendan Sheriff, they were the exceptions. They were also Outland Trophy winners. Well, they, you know, when I... <clears throat> joined the Kansas City Chiefs in 1969. There were only three players in the NFL over 300 pounds. We yeah. had two of them. Um, we had Buck Buchanan and um, now I'm, I'm, I'm blanking out on the other one, but now I was looking, the offensive line for South Dakota State are all over 300 pounds. How did this happen? in just, uh, you know, one generation. South Dakota State's uh, offensive line is bigger than Iowa's, on average, if you look at weight. But as we saw with Bulaga, Riley Reef, uh, some of the other great offensive guards who became tackles, they were 290 when they played, uh, but they were also 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, so it, it, uh, Iowa historically has liked their offensive linemen around 290. 293. They like them quicker uh, on their feet to get out to the edge. And, uh, but now you can be 301 pounds and still be really quick. Uh, Tyler Ellsbury is another name uh, that I overlooked before uh, from Byron, Illinois. He's going to play tomorrow. Uh, so a lot of these guys are, uh, you know, they'll try and protect, uh, you know, the nicked in the shoulder, stingers, that kind of thing they've been suffering in the fall camp. Nothing that's season long, but hopefully... Uh, we can get some turnovers, get the lead early, steadily get control of the football game, and then you'll see all these guys in there. Okay? All right. Thanks for being here today. Enjoy the rest of Fry Fest. See you tomorrow at Kinnick. Go Thanks. Hawks. Go Hawks. Thanks, everybody. And ladies and gentlemen, the voices of Iowa football, Mr. Gary Dolphin, and number 14 himself, Eddie Polak.